What's up my stat stars, Michael Prenchuk here for AP Statistics. And what we're gonna do in this video is teach you a really big topic in a very short amount of time. And that topic is sampling distributions for sample proportions. Now this is a huge topic that's gonna lay the foundation for everything we need, not only in this unit, but in unit six as well. So let's get right down to it. Maybe one day at the dentist's office, you heard that 71% of 10 year olds across the United States believe in the tooth fairy. Got that wiggly tooth, you're gonna put it underneath your pillow and a tooth fairy is gonna bring you some money the next day. Now, if this is the true proportion of all 10 year olds across the entire United States, we would call this a population parameter because it's a true value, a true numerical description for the entire population. We'd use the symbol P, yep, just a simple P to represent that 71%. But what if we took a random sample of 230 10 year olds selected from across the United States? From this sample, we could get what we call a sample proportion. That would be the proportion from the sample that said, yes, they believe the tooth fairy. Now, this is not the population proportion that's true for all 10 year olds across the United States. It's only that which is true for our sample of 230. Now, the symbol we would hear, we'd use here is a P hat. Yes, yeah, it's just a P with a little tiny accent mark, carrot, whatever you want to call it on top. And we use that little hat to differentiate between the true P that we know that's true for the entire United States, that's the 71%, and our sample proportion that's just true, well, for our sample of 230 students. Now, what do we expect our sample proportion to be? We haven't even selected the 230 kids yet. We're getting ready to. We're gonna ask them if they believe in the tooth fairy. And, you know, I guess we would expect to get something around 71% because that's what's true. But samples do one thing very, very well, and that is that they vary. See what I did there? Very, V-E-R-Y. V-A-R-Y, okay, yeah, you get it. But that's the idea, is that samples vary, and just because we expect to get 71% doesn't mean that we will. Now, before we go any further, we gotta talk about one out of three really important rules, and that is that it does have to be a random sample. Because if it's not random, then we allow a little bit of bias to possibly creep into our sample. And if we have bias in our sample, we might not get what we want. For example, if we just out of pure convenience, asked 230 kids at one elementary school. Well, there could be that one student, Billy, who's already gone around the entire school and told everybody that the tooth fairy doesn't exist. So from that sample, we're probably gonna get a very, very, very low proportion of kids that believe the tooth fairy, and it's not gonna be anywhere near the 71% that's true. So samples do have to vary, and they do have to be random. And if they're not random, you have bias. And if you have bias, well, everything I'm teaching in this video is not gonna be correct. Now the truth is, before we even take a look at that sample of 230 kids, we truly have no idea what that sample proportion is gonna be. It's, well, random. We do know that it's gonna be a number between zero and one, but we don't know exactly what's gonna be. Certainly we would expect 71%, but again, samples vary, so it might not be exactly 71%. What this means is that we could actually view the sample proportion as a continuous random variable. All right, so maybe after all the dust settles and we ask all the kids in our sample, do you believe in the tooth fairy? And we come back with a sample proportion of 65%. Okay, a little bit lower than 71%, eh, no big deal. Now, what if we decide to go ahead and get a whole nother sample of 230 random 10 year olds from across the United States? What would we expect that sample to be? Well, we would expect it to be near 71%, but it's not guaranteed to be 65% either because that's just what our other samples showed. So the next sample is gonna be, well, its own thing as well, because again, the sample proportion is a continuous random variable. That means the outcome could be a number, well, whatever number it ends up being. Maybe we get 72% in that second sample that said yes, they believe in the tooth fairy. Now here comes rule number two out of three that we gotta talk about. Since we're now talking about not just one sample, but a second sample, maybe even a third sample, we need these samples to be independent of each other. And the only way to guarantee that my second sample is independent from the first sample is if after I take that first sample of kids, I put them all back to possibly be picked again. 
but in the real world, we typically don't do that. When we sample, we don't think about putting the first sample or the second sample back. Now, we actually have a rule that says this is totally okay. As long as our sample size, in our case 230, is less than 10% of the entire population from which we were picking from, then we can still assume independence even if we don't put that sample back. Now, technically, because we're not putting that sample back, we are violating independence, but any difference is negligible as long as our sample size is under 10% of the population. So selecting 230 kids, I would assume, is under 10% of the millions of 10-year-old kids that are living in the United States. Now, if we started to repeatedly sample, take out 230 10-year-old kids, ask that they believe in the tooth fairy, get a sample of proportion, and then rinse and repeat like a million times. I mean, if you think about it, there's millions of 10-year-old kids across the United States. That means that there's probably tons and tons and tons of different samples of 230 of them. So imagine if we just start repeatedly sample, 230 kids, 230 kids, 230 kids, we would get a lot of different sample proportions. So for starters, let's just stick with 100. Let's say that we looked at 100 samples, each containing 230 students, 10-year-old students, and we asked them, do you believe in the tooth fairy? That means we're going to have 100 sample proportions. Well, here are the results of those 100 samples. Here we see a distribution where every single one of these dots represents the sample proportion from a sample of 230 random 10 year old students. And it's showing us the sample proportion of those kids that said they believe in the tooth fairy. So we see a dot for every one of those samples. We see some low is around 63%, some as high as 78%, but most are right around 70, 71, 72%. This is what we call a probability distribution. It shows the values of the continuous random variable. In this case, the proportion of 10 year old kids in a sample of 230 that believe in the tooth fairy. And it shows what those sample proportions could be as well as which ones are more likely. So for these 100 samples, we see that it ranged from about 63 to 78%, but we see that sample proportions down at those ends are much less likely, around 63 and 78%, and sample proportions in the middle, around 71%, are much more likely. Now imagine, instead of just looking at 100 samples, we looked at all of them every single possible sample of 230 random 10 year olds from across the United States. And we created a distribution of every one of those sample proportions. Well, first, theoretically, this would kind of be impossible, but if we could do it, it would be called a sampling distribution for the sample proportions. That's what a sampling distribution is. It's a representation of every possible sample proportion from every possible sample of size 230. Now, again, that would be pretty hard to actually look at all those samples, but theoretically, we could think about that sampling distribution. Officially, a sampling distribution of a statistic is the distribution of values for the statistic for all possible samples of a given size from a given population. In our problem, the statistic is the sample proportion that believe in the tooth fairy, the sample size is 230, and the population is 10-year-old children in America. Now, a true sampling distribution can be obtained through repeated sampling. Now, actually taking that many samples would be pretty difficult, but here's the crazy thing. Sampling distributions for sample proportions are very, very predictable. So here are three things we know that are true for every sampling distribution for sample proportions. First, the mean of all the sample proportions will be the true population proportion. Think about that for one second. If we took the mean, mu, of all possible p hats, remember, there's tons of them out there, the mean of all the sample proportions would be equal to the true population proportion smack dab in the middle. That should make complete sense. Remember, we expect to get 71% of kids in our sample that believe in tooth fairy, but we know we might not get it but we expect it to be 71%. That's because the mean of all p hats should be 71%. Yes, yeah, some of them are gonna be more than 71%, some of them are gonna be less than 71%, but if we take the mean of them all, we should get that true population parameter right smack dab in the center. The second big thing we know is that sampling distributions are filled with sample proportions and sampling proportions are going to vary. 
and we can actually measure that variation with the standard deviation. So there is a formula for the standard deviation of all those p hats. It's pretty simple formula. It's a giant square root. Inside of that square root is a fraction. The numerator is p, the population proportion, times one minus p, that would just be the opposite of p, divided by the sample size n. Now, because the n is in the denominator, that tells us that the bigger the samples we select, the lower the standard deviation. And that should actually make complete sense because bigger samples should be more accurate. And if bigger samples are more accurate, that means that they're going to vary less. And that means that we would get a value for our sample proportion that's closer to the truth. Smaller samples are going to vary more. A smaller sample could be all over the place. And that's why they would produce a larger standard deviation. The third feature that we know is true for all sampling distributions for sample proportions is that the shape of the distribution is going to be normal. Now this is awesome because, well, we love the normal model, but hold on a minute. Here comes the third rule. The shape will only be normal if our sample is big enough. Well, how do you know if your sample is big enough? Well, it's actually a pretty simple rule. We simply have to have 10 or more expected successes and 10 or more expected failures. So how do you check if you have that? Well, you simply take your sample size n and you multiply it by p. That would be your expected number of successes. As long as that number is 10 or more, we're good to go. Then we take our sample size 230 and multiply it by one minus p. This is gonna produce our expected number of failures and this number needs to be 10 or more as well. So as long as we have 10 or more expected successes and failures in our sample, then we are big enough for that shape to be normal. Now let's go back to that distribution that we had for 100 samples. Now by no means is this a true sampling distribution because a true sampling distribution has the results for every possible sample proportion out there. Well, this was only looking at 100, so it's like the start of a sampling distribution. But what I wanna show you is that those three qualities that I just spoke about are visible in this graph. First, we already see the center, the mean of all the sample proportions is right around 71%, which is what the true population proportion is. We also see the fact that there is a standard deviation because samples do vary. Some samples are more than 71% and some samples are less than 71%. And the last thing we see is the shape. It actually does look roughly normal where we see on the tails, the far left and the far right are way less likely outcomes than the outcomes in the middle, which are right around that 71%. So we do kind of see this nice mound shape, normal distribution forming, and we've only looked at 100 samples. Now again, it's very difficult to create an actual sampling distribution because it's very hard to look at every possible sample. But what we can do is we can model a sampling distribution and this is the most important part of the video. So let's just say that 71% of kids, 10 year olds across the United States believe in the tooth fairy. What would we expect for a sample of 230? Well, we don't even actually have to go and get any samples to know what that sampling distribution could look like. Now that's crazy, let me repeat that one more time. As long as we know the sample size 230 and we know the true population proportion P, 71%, we don't have to look at any samples to know what the sampling distribution will look like. Here we go. First, the mean of the sampling distribution will be the mean of all the p hats, and that should be the truth, right smack dab in the center, 0.71. But again, the rule is that those samples do have to be random to avoid bias. Next up, we have the idea that those sample proportions are going to vary. So the standard deviation of those sample proportions p hat is gonna be the giant square root of 0.71, that was our p, times one minus 0.71, which is gonna end up being 0.29, divided by 230, and we get 0.0299, like just short of 3%. But again, the only way that this formula is usable if we know that we have independence between all of our samples which if we don't replace, remember we actually don't have independence, but as long as our sample size of 230 is under 10% of the population, it's totally fine to assume that they will be independent, even if technically they're not. Lastly, the shape of the sampling distribution will be normal. Again, as long as our sample size is big enough, so we simply have to take 230 times 0.71 and 230 times 0.29, as long as our successes and failures are both 10 or more, which they are, then the sampling distribution will be normal. 
So here is a picture of that sampling distribution. And let me remind you for a third time, we haven't actually officially looked at any samples and we already know what they will all look like, or at least we can model what they'll all look like. So right smack dab in the center, we see the mean of 0.71. Then I went up one, two, three standard deviations. Now remember our standard deviation was 0.0299, which is really, really close to 3%. So I went up to 74%, 77%, 80%. Then we gotta go down one, two, three standard deviations, 68, 65, and 62%. And of course, the last part is that this shape is normal. Now, so this is what it looks like. And again, it's awesome. So before we even go and look at a sample of 230 students, we already know what to expect. We would certainly expect something around 68 to 74% because that's where the large majority of sample portions will be. A sample proportion of like 90% or 50% would be extremely unlikely, probably not gonna happen. And that's it. This is how we could build a sampling distribution for sample proportions. What we're doing here is simply modeling what all possible sample proportions would look like of a certain sample size, because remember if we change the sample size then we change the standard deviation and that could shrink the model in or spread the model out and all of those samples do have to be taken from the same population. Now, once we have this model, it is a probability distribution. It shows us what's most likely in the center and what's less likely out towards the ends. And once we have a probability distribution and it's normal, we can answer some pretty cool probability questions like this. Let's say that we want to know what is the probability that a sample of 230 10 year old children shows 75% or more that believe in the tooth fairy. Well, all we have to do is figure out where does 75% fall on our model. Well, first we're gonna go ahead and look at our model and we see that 75% falls a little bit more than one standard deviation above the mean. But if we're gonna answer probability questions about it, we need to figure out where it falls on the standard normal model, which means we need z-scores. So we're gonna go ahead and find the z-score for a 0.75 by subtracting the mean, 0.71, dividing by the standard deviation, 0.0299, you guys should know how to find a z-score, and we get a z-score of 1.338. So we're trying to find the probability that a sample proportion is greater than 0.75, which is the probability that a z-score on the standard normal model is greater than 1.338. Now, how are we gonna do that? Well, of course we could use our calculator or we could use a Z table. I'm gonna go ahead and use the calculator here, use normal uh, CDF, start at a lower value of 1.338, go to an upper value of 99, acting like infinity, and I get 0.0904. That means 9.04% of all possible sample proportions of 230 children taken from a population of all 10 year olds will be greater than 75%. That's how easy it is to build a sampling distribution for sample proportions. All you need is two things, the population proportion P and the sample size N. That's it, then you can find your mean, your standard deviation, and of course the shape. But don't forget about the three rules. The sample's gotta be random, the sample size has to be under 10% of the population, and your sample must have 10 or more expected successes and 10 or more expected failures to be big enough for the normal distribution to work. But once you have that normal distribution set up, when you have the mean and the standard deviation, then finding any problem that deals with probability is really, really simple. All you gotta do is calculate some z-scores and use normal CDF on your calculator to find probabilities in that standard normal distribution. All right, that's it. Plan on some videos coming up later that show more examples, but I want this to be a quick introduction to how to build a sampling distribution for sample proportions and for it all to make sense. So hopefully you enjoyed it, hopefully you liked it, and stay tuned for more videos, please.